Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm Amin with Sira Masters, developing the Muslim mindset for success. This week, as usual, we got another Friday video, and this one is special and it's exclusive. It's an interview with our teacher, Muhammad Munir, also known as Mufti from Hadith Disciple. That's his channel that a friend of mine who studied with him uh, showed me and he's got a lot of his lessons on there. He's a graduate of Medina University and he specializes in Hadith. He's passionate about Hadith and so many other things. I think you'll see that in this special interview with him where we explore um, motivation, aiming high, ambition um, in light of the Sunnah. You know, a lot of the time I look at books from non-Muslims and so I always want to know like, what does the Sunnah say about this? What do our scholars, what does our history say about this? to merge them together to get even more powerful insights. That's exactly what we get out of this great interview. Uh, Muhammad interviewed him. He wanted to make a contribution uh, to Sira Masters. And so Muhammad is the interviewer for this. I hope you enjoy it. Ask Allah to accept from us and him and everyone watching and that you benefit and you take inspiration from it to, to see the, the great um, history you have and the great uh, sources that we have in our religion to push us to go further. Inshallah, this isn't the last of encounters with the teacher, with the uh, Mufti, and uh, enjoy the the interview. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Oh yeah, check out his channel, I'll link it, Hadith Disciple, where he got a lot of his lessons. Uh, I like to watch those. Um, so, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, welcome to the interview. We're here, we have our Ustad, our teacher and brother Muhammad Munir, also known as Mufti from Hadith Disciples. And I highly recommend you check out the YouTube channel. I've highly benefited from it myself. Now at Sira Masters, we talk a lot about being motivated and we talk a lot about having lofty ambitions. The term Uluwul Himma is often associated with this. So Ustad, what is Uluwul Himma? Uh, first and foremost, as I said before, it's a, a pleasure to speak with you. And hopefully, uh, by Allah's permission, one day we'll actually meet in person. Be in the night, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if not, uh, then hopefully we'll meet in paradise. Inshallah. With the rest of our brothers and sisters. Be in the night, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and it's, uh, I'm very happy to uh, have the interview with you. And hopefully our interview will be a means of us reminding each other that which is beneficial, that which is good, that which will help our souls, and that which will help us uh, be better Muslims and servants of Rahman, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's in brief. Not to take any more time, I would say uh, the concept of high motivations is, to me, a staple part of a person's Islam. A staple part of your uh, you being a Muslim, and that is that we believe as Muslims in the statement of Allah, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah says, I haven't created jinn and men except to worship me. In this verse, there are several different interpretations of the people of knowledge. Some of them say that the verse pertains to the believers, uh, and that Allah only created them to be believers. And other uh, mufassirin, scholars of uh, tafsir, they have different views on the exact meaning and objective of the verse. What is important is that we are Muslims, well, alhamdulillah, we ask Allah to keep us upon us, man. Mm -hmm. The purpose of our creation is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So who created us? And how did he create us? Why did he create us? And what is the reward and the bounty and the generous gift that lies for those who fulfill this purpose of creation? All of these things, there lies no doubt, they add to the concept of motivation and high aspirations. Allah, Al-Khaliq, subhanahu wa ta'ala, how he created man, the miraculous nature of man's creation, and the nobility for which he has been created, and the place which uh, man will go by Allah's permission if he fulfills that uh, wisdom. That, there lies no doubt about that. That is like, as we say, brown on rice when it comes to motivation high aspirations, okay, just realizing who made you, how he made you, why he made you, and for what reason, and what lies in store for those who fulfill that which they're supposed to fulfill. 
Dear Allah, no doubt, everything on my jinn is high and lofty. Everything about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is high and lofty. Everything about man's creation shows the power of Allah, the sublime and the exalted. Rather, Allah tells us in the Quran, Antum Ashadu Khalqan Amin Sama. What is hard is to create, you or the heavens. So therefore Allah tells us about his power and his might, despite the magnificent nature of man's body and his mind and his heart and his soul. So I think in my humble opinion, uh, that high uh, aspirations and motivation in Islam are considered to be uh, a staple part of everyone's Islam. It should be a staple part of your Islam. That's in brief, of course. SubhanAllah. So, from what I understood, it's sufficient for one to ponder over the one who created us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how great and lofty and high Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, and the reason he created us to worship him, and our goal to be with Allah in Jannah. These are all things that are sufficient as a motivation for us. Without a doubt. And this is just the, the general way of looking at it. This is not in the specifics. When Allah clearly talks about the levels of paradise, when the Prophet ﷺ speaks about, he says, "Ana Sayyidu wa Adam wa la He says, without any pride, without any boasting or bragging or showing off, I'm the best of the children of Adam. And he also told us in another authentic hadith that when you hear the Mu'addin making the adhan, فَقُولُ مِثْلَ مَا يَقُولُ Then say what the Mu'addin says. Repeat after him. He says, then you send prayers upon me. He then says, ثُمَّ سَلَ اللَّهَ لِلْوَسِيلَةَ فَإِنَّهَا مَزْلُتٌ فِي الْجَنَّةِ he says, ask Allah to give me the wasila. And he says, and this wasila is a high station in paradise. لا تنبغي إلا لعبد من عباد الله وأنا أرجو أن أكون أنه. He says, and no one will get this station except for a chosen slave of Allah. And perhaps it is me. Allah tells us, وفي ذلك فليتنافس المتنافسون. Let those who wish to compete, those who wish to have high aspirations, high goals, those who wish to... Uh, Class for something, let them fight and struggle and compete for this, the levels of Jannah, the levels of paradise. Okay, so, uh, and the list goes on of ayat in the Quran and hadith of the Prophet mm-hmm. that talk about the specific virtues. Uh, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan narrates in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet says, Atul al Nasi yom al Qiyamah, he says, Oh, in Atul al Nasi anaq al yom al Qiyamah al Mu'adhinun. The people who have the longest necks on the Day of Judgment are those who make the event. Those who make the event. So this authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim tells us of a specific virtue of a mu'addin. And for this reason, many of the scholars of Islam say that the best thing to do in Islam is be a mu'addin. And others say, rather, it's best to be an imam in the religion. The point is neither here or there. We're trying to make, uh, establish something is that there are levels, there are darajats in the dunya, in the grave, and in the hereafter. So all of these things push you uh, and steer you to having high motivations and not being pleased with just a little, with just, uh, just you know, and being complacent, but wanting more. Now, we could, uh, Akhi Muhammad, go and branch off so many other issues, seeking knowledge, struggling in a lost cause, uh, spending in a lost cause. The Prophet said, he tells us in the famous hadith of Uthman and Afan, okay, inside Bukhari, that the Prophet said, Man bana, he says, Man bana lillahi masjidan, bana Allahu lahu mithluhu fil jannah. Okay, man qal. He says, Whoever builds a house for Allah, Allah will build for him the likes of it in paradise. Now, this hadith is often misunderstood all of the time. What is meant by building a house for Allah? And what is meant by Allah will build for him the likes in paradise? Does it mean that there's an actual house or that there's the reward for building the house? Well, what's meant by building a house for Allah, making your own masjid, erecting a building, constructing a masjid, or supporting and contributing to the masjid? There's a narration outside of Sayyid Bukhari that states in the Sunnah of Imam Ibn Majah, وَلَوْ كَانَ كَمِثْ حَسِي قُطَى He says, even if it's like a pigeon's nest, a bird's nest, even if it's that small and simple, and the two interpretations of this as well, and some of the ulama say, with regards to contributing, giving a brick, paying for the lights, paying for this, giving whatever you can, even like a bird's nest. And Hafiz bin Hajar rahimahullah in Fatih al-Badi, the classical commentary of Sayyid Bukhari, he says, is that when we used to travel, he says we saw musallayat, small places for prayer on the road, small like a pigeon's nest. 
It's not a building. It's not a large place. But just for you to put your head down and make sujood. And that's what you'll get in paradise. So this hadith teaches us is that there are virtues and that there are levels and there are ranks. So what type of house do you want in paradise? What type of house do you want in the dunya? A mansion or a small one bedroom studio or bedroom apartment? You live in a shack or something of comfort? So there lies no doubt. Uh, as I said before, I don't think that there's a Muslim except that he needs and thrives off of motivation, high aspiration. That's the lifeblood of Iman. Getting more, the love of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a higher level, a higher station in this life and in hereafter. Allah says, those are the messengers we gave preference. Some of them were better than others. Some of them were higher than others. Some from those messengers Allah spoke to. Mujahid ibn Jabr said, that's Musa alayhi salam. And he raised others in levels, Muhammad alayhi salam. So high aspirations, as he said, in general, uh, this life, the grave, Jannah, specifically, is a staple part of your iman, let alone when you start talking about seeking the ill knowledge, hadith. What do you want to be? I remember in Medina, not to go too long, but in my early years in the college of hadith, I met some brothers from Sweden. Uh, and this brother, he began complaining about some other students of knowledge. And he was saying, you know, there are students of knowledge that answer people's questions. There are students of knowledge who talk about divorce and things like this. This is horrible. This is terrible. You should only translate for the scholars. You should be a translator. You should wish to translate for the people. And wallah, akhi, I was younger, okay, and, you know, I was appalled at this speech. How can you go overseas, leave your family, leave your comfort zone, go to a different place, go to all types of trials and tribulations, and only want to go back to your country as a translator. Eight, seven years taken from your life to translate, that's it. So there lies no doubt. This brother, unfortunately, he didn't have high aspirations. He didn't have motivations. And uh, me living in Medina for over a decade out of my life, I've seen a lot. And I've seen a lot of brothers come from the UK, from uh, other European countries, uh, France, uh, uh, let alone America and Canada and things like this, Australia. Uh, South Africa, quote unquote, the Western countries, the Westernized countries, and a lot of them quit, dropped out. Uh, some of them who did graduate, they left as they came. And there are a select few that actually benefited themselves and, and raised the bar. Most of those brothers that quit, that dropped out, that didn't really benefit, they didn't have high aspirations. And they may have read some of what the pious predecessors said about this type of seeking knowledge and, and the sunnah and innovation, but they didn't read what the pious predecessors said about ulu al hidmah high aspirations. Now, I'll leave you with this one thing on this topic. There was a poet who said, uh, he said, Kunu rajulan, rijluhu fithura. He says, be a man whose feet are in the dirt. Warasuhu fithuraya. And his mind is in the constellations. In other words, you're a normal human being, but you have to reach for the stars, as we say. You have to have high goals from day one. I want to be something. I want to be from the people who, 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 not just a translator. So this is a very important concept, uh, the positive and the negative. If you implement it properly, it can take you far. And if you don't have no knowledge of it, let alone neglect it, you're not going to study and, and work hard and excel. Allahu Alam. SubhanAllah. And you mentioned many beautiful um, acts that are a fruit of this high ambitions and motivation such as seeking knowledge, such as building masajid and striving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does this mean that our ambition should only be in those things that are worship, such as going to the masjid and praying and seeking knowledge? Or is this general? We say uh, that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's general and it's specific. Yes and no. Uh, in general, the Prophet tells us, in Allah Ketubil Ishaad he says that it's Allah has ordained Sand in all things. And the word sand has different meanings, as you know. And many times the word sand means perfection. It means professionalism. The Prophet he told us this. He says, when you slaughter an animal, slaughter it perfectly. Okay? The proper Islamic manner. Not torturing the animal. He says, well, you hid the He says, one of you should sharpen his blade. And even though he's talking about sacrificial sacrifice or offering sacrifice, it is deeper than that. 
and it can be metaphorically used. The prophet says, sharpen your blade. You get a job. You work here, you do this, you go to school. Whatever you do, do it the right way. Do it the sharp, professional way. Don't be sloppy. Don't be dull. The Muslim, if a Muslim goes to study medicine or law, you see the top of the class. For this, what we just mentioned, let alone the fact that whether you like or not, you're representing Islam. Your name is Ahmed or Muhammad or Ali, and you're representing Islam. You're representing the Muslims. And it allows no doubt people will accept Islam because of your professionalism. People will learn about the religion or at least respect the religion because this guy, look at this guy, he comes to class every day on time. On sports, he comes early, he works the hardest, he practices the hardest, he has the best sportsmanship. Professionalism in whatever you do, be sharp, whatever you do. So this is a general Islamic concept. You should want to be the best. You should want to do the best. Not just for your ego, but having a standard of quality. Having a standard of quality. And that my name is on this thing, let alone me representing Islam. I have, I have to represent it properly. It's not just about me boasting and bragging, but no Muslim should ever want to be sloppy. No Muslim should ever want to be a slouch. No Muslim should ever want to be, as we say, jack leg. Okay, doing things in a half manner. You want to do things the best way. It has an effect upon your body your mind and your soul when you practice Islam properly. If you wake up early in the morning for Salat al-Fajr, get out of your bed. It may be cold outside. You brush your teeth. You make wudu. You go to the masjid to pray, to read. What is the rest of your day going to be like? What type of work ethic are you going to have? Is the Muslim going to be late for work? If you make taraweeh, you make tahajjud at night, you read the Quran, you give sadaqah, are you going to be lazy? Are you going to steal? Are you going to cheat? So the point we're trying to get to is that these things are going to overlap in the rest of your uh, worldly uh, actions. So it isn't specific. No. The Muslim should try to be the best in anything that he does based off of the proof that we mentioned. Allah tells us, Kuntum khayru ummatin ukhrijat nas. He says, you're the best nation arisen from man. And that is in an Islamic sense without a doubt and other, other senses as well. And just read history. Look at, look at the Muslims. Look at their contribution to the world. If it wasn't for the Muslims, then we wouldn't have the number zero. And there's no calculation without the number zero. Okay? The number zero is, a, is like the thumb to the hand. The number zero is like the thumb to the hand. It's a vital aspect. That one small digit makes a world of a difference. The Muslims, what they did with regards to exploration, uh, astronomy, uh, algebra, coffee, the usage of caffeine, and the list goes on. Things that the Muslims did of medicine, and the list goes on, and we don't have time to mention what the Muslims did. They lost no doubt from the fuel behind this energy was their sense of high aspiration, ambitions, goals to do something, to make something. But the no aspect of the question, Afi Muhammad, is, is that the Muslim just doesn't work for the dunya. He doesn't just do it just because it's professionalism, but it's, it's a bad behind it as well. And that is much bigger than me or than you, but. I'm a professional not only because that's the right thing to do, but because, as I said, I'm representing Islam. And I wish to call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and calling to Allah is an obligation upon every single Muslim. Those who have a lot of knowledge, of course, they have to do more. Those who have the free time, they have to do more. Those who have the talent and the ability, obviously, they have to do more. But every single Muslim is a caller to Allah. And sometimes you may not call to Allah verbally, but you can call to Allah physically through your actions, in your office, in your business, in your shop, even an athlete. Not getting into the specifics of what sports are permissible or unpermissible, impermissible, but the concept of being an athlete, okay? Uh, uh, the concept of boxing. Not saying boxing is permissible, but you don't think people are looking at this person and seeing that he's a Muslim? And how and it has an effect upon people. How do you accept Islam because of Muhammad Ali? It's real, it's a reality. How many people learned about Islam just because he was such an excellent fighter, outstanding champion? So uh, professionalism is important, but there has to be an intention behind it. Allah says, Allah ala I know many The Prophet declared that he calls to Allah with knowledge and his followers as well. And there isn't a Muslim except that he's a follower of Muhammad. So therefore, some of the people of knowledge, they say, is that... Uh, uh, da'wah is an obligation upon every single Muslim according to his or her level. So therefore, 
you being a good doctor, a good physician, a good surgeon, it's the good thing to do, it's the right thing to do, it's Islamically supported, but it has to be a deeper concept. It has to be a deeper concept. Teach the people about Islam through your skill, through your profession, through your talent, through what Allah has given you. So it's, it's a yes and it's a no answer. And I think it's amazing what you said that when you truly practice Islam, it will penetrate every area of your life, your mind, your actions, everything, and that everything we do is ibadah. So we excel, mm -hmm. not for the sake of the dunya, but for the sake of the akhirah. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And um, this concept of motivation has become very, very popular in sort of modern psychology. There's many bestsellers, and even many Muslims are running to these books and reading these books about motivation, reading biographies even sometimes of non-Muslims to get inspired by them. How can we turn to the sunnah and the Islamic principles and our civilization history to inform us with this regard? Uh, I would say maybe last summer I did a, a talk and um, I was in Minnesota and I believe the city that we were in was on the outskirts of Minneapolis and uh, it was one of the oldest masjids in, in, in Minnesota actually uh, and in the talk we spoke on well I named the talk from nothing to everything and I talked on how the companions lived how was the Arabian Peninsula during that time uh, the social, political, economic, spiritual condition of the people and how low and base they were and how when Islam came to them and they followed it, they believed in it, they supported it, they lived for it and they died for it, how they became everything. And it's very interesting when you read what the non-Muslims say about this man Muhammad and his movement and his followers, whether those who like him or dislike him, love him or hate him, but they all agree on one thing and that is the uh, supernatural power and strength of his movement, the swiftness of Muhammad's conquering and how his land spread like wildfire overnight. He went from being persecuted and driven out of his hometown, having his followers being killed and tortured and mutilated to masters of the Arabian Peninsula let alone to North Africa, Mesopotamia, the, the different places where Islam spread within a number of years. I mean, just look at Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was an enemy to Islam, someone who disliked the Prophet sallallahu severely. And in a number of years, he had conquered Iran and Iraq. This is an amazing feat. So if you just look, what drove them? What pushed them to become what they became? How did they get what they got? What did Zayd ibn Thabit say? He said that the Prophet will receive letters and from different delegates from the Jews of Medina and the outskirts of Medina. And he asked me to learn Hebrew. He says, فَمَا مَرَّ عَلَيَّ نِصْفُ شَهَرْ حَتَّى حَذَقْتُهَا He says, I learned Hebrew in half of a month, 14 to 15 days. Why? Because he had an ambition to serve his land. So the point that I think is, is that reading the Sirah is uh, more than enough for high ambitions, for motivation. How did the Prophet turn to, from that to this? How did Islam go from two people, three people, five people to 100,000 companions in Hajj al And then where did Islam go? Where did Islam spread? And like I said, what did, it do, what did Islam do for civilization? Where would modern Europe be without the Muslims? Everybody understand these things? So the concept of uh, what drove the Prophet Sallallahu what drove the companions to do what they did and achieve what they achieved, all of these things can be read in the seerah of the Nabi al-Kareem, let alone the fact that many people who became famous uh, and became wise and influential, they took a lot of their knowledge and a lot of their wisdom from the Muslims. And this is something that many of them, uh, they'll confess and they'll speak on, and many of them, they hide this, this information. But we actually read the facts. And sit down and analyze the data, you'll find it's the same. It's the same. So my advice is for a Muslim to look at anything that he or she needs or wants, you can find it in the Sirah of the Nabi and Kareem. Everything. Patience, perseverance, success, uh, bravery, chivalry, everything that you can possibly think about is found in the Sirah. And from those things what I talked about in that, in that lecture is how they had high aspirations and everything that's going on in your life, it happens to the companions. Those who revert to Islam, those who are born Muslim, those who are a problem of sins, their parents, their forefathers, 
your siblings, substance abuse, the, alcohol, the companions, drug alcohol in large amounts. And when Allah sent down the prohibition of alcohol, what did they do? And it's what Allah says that the streets were pouring with wine, with liquor. So anything that's happening in your life, before you go to this uh, psychology and this and that, you can find out what the companions did. And that's not saying it's unlawful for a person to read about someone's uh, autobiography. It's not saying that it's unlawful for a person to take wisdom from a non-Muslim. As is mentioned in some narrations, that wisdom is the lost possession of the believer. Wherever he finds it, he takes it. However, we have the best, purest, most pristine source of wisdom, the best example for ambitions. And those ambitions, I mean, just think about it. From the Prophet ﷺ being persecuted to walking into Mecca, walking, striding into Mecca, riding into Mecca, and everyone has submitted to Islam within a number of years. You read histories of certain countries, how long it took them to subdue, to conquer, to, to civilize, quote-unquote. It took years. Bloodshed. People were killed and slain for there to be total success and domination. It wasn't like that in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And there's a reason why. And from those reasons was that high station, that high level. Allah talks about this in the Qur'an, that the Prophet ﷺ will have the maqam mahmud. And there's no, nothing higher than that. لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَةً Those who do well, they will have goodness in their after, and they will have even more. So look at the verse here. Allah mentions two things. Allah says, for those who do well, there are two things. There's husna and ziyada. Allah doesn't say that which is hasan. He says husna, something which is the most best, huh? the most excellent, the most meritorious. And then there's something that's even more. So there's a further push. There's more striving to be made. And husna is paradise. And ziyada is looking at the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as has been explained in the sunnah of the Prophet So you, anything that you want of ambitions, you're going to find in the sunnah. However, we would say that sight sometimes is weak and perception is often strong. So how do you look at these books? How do you perceive them? Let alone the Muslims don't even pick up the books, who so don't know about the books, who so don't understand anything from seerah and its importance and its virtue. But when you do look into the seerah, you get how you perceive. If you can take these stories and apply them to 2016, there lies no doubt you're going to get, there's not enough time to read and study these things. But some Muslims, they don't read, or some Muslims, they're not properly trained about the importance of the seerah and how to extract it. And physically, what? Apply it to the modern times. Oh, that's a beautiful story about Abu Bakr Siddiq. He gave all of his wealth for Allah and his master. That's beautiful. But that is applicable to 2016, high aspirations. The Prophet says, who visited a sick person today? Who followed a janazah? Who gave sadaqah? Who did this? Who did that? What did Abu Bakr Siddiq say? I did. I did. I did. I did. That lies no doubt that Abu Bakr Siddiq had what? High ambitions. And he still had business. He still traded. He still was wealthy and rich and supported Islam despite all the worship that he did. It goes to show that he had high ambitions. And those high ambitions were nothing more than a result of Muhammad's teachings. Ibn Qayyim says that beneficial knowledge and righteous actions are twins who come from one parent. And that parent is, he says, high aspiration. That's the mother of uh, beneficial knowledge and righteous action. That's the entire deen. Inna ladina amanu wa aminu salihat. That is the deen from the beginning to the end. Righteous deeds based off of beneficial knowledge that is your iman. So that's what I would say about that. Hmm. And I think everybody that's listening by now definitely understands the importance of ulul al-himma or motivation or lofty ambitions. What practical, implementable techniques or strategies do you use to stay motivated? Me personally? You personally. Well, uh, I'll probably consider myself my harshest critic. Um, those of my friends who know me, uh, they know I, 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 I hate to listen to myself speak and talk. Brothers, this is mashallah, that was a beautiful khutbah mufti. That was a, I, I, it was average at, that, at best. So from the things that keep me motivated is constant self-criticism. And I would say reading the biographies of the scholars of hadith. Reading the biographies of the scholars of hadith. Okay, we memorize a book. Okay, you memorize 40 hadith. 
Bulugh al Maram. He memorizes things. Somebody, alhamdulillah, was talented. He may memorize the Riyadh Salihin or Lut al Marjan. In Yemen, we memorize the Sahih Bukhari. Somebody memorizes the Sahih Bukhari is a major accomplishment. And now, in these days, However, when you read about the ulama of hadith of the past, how these big, large books were toys to them, pacifiers to them, they were playthings. There was nothing for a person to memorize a thousand hadith, six thousand hadith. So when you read how these ulama, the, 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 the ability that they all gave them to hold in information, to decipher information without paper, without pens, without Dewey Decimal Systems, when you read how amazing their minds were, it makes you scorn yourself. And when you scorn yourself and you criticize yourself, it makes you work harder. It pushes you to drive harder, to go stronger. You understand what I'm saying? So me personally, this is what I like to do. I like to read these stories, preferably on a daily basis. Uh, the ulama from the 3rd century, the 4th century. Okay, the fifth century. Adar uh, al rahimahullah. What did Adar say about him? He says, وَإِذَا طَالَعْتَ كِتَابُهُ الْعِلَمْ تَنْدَهِشْ وَيَطُولُ تَعَجُّبُكَ He says, when you read about this man's life, he died 385 of the Hijra. Adar al was a great scholar from Baghdad, uh, one of the foremost uh, hadith authorities of that century. Adar of the eighth century, he said, when you read his book, Al-Ilal, which is the most difficult, back-breaking science of hadith, he says he wrote it from his memory. He says when you read that book, he says, Tendehish. He says you almost go crazy. You almost lose your mind. You almost pass out. And he says your amazement never ceases. How in the heck did he write this book from his memory? How is it possible for him to write down this name, this person, this and that? Like, it's amazing. So that pushes you, that drives you to work harder. My memory is nothing. I can't be pleased with the degree. And I study with it. And I have to go harder. I have to work harder. I have to push myself even more. Okay, so this is one of the things that I do. Another thing is, uh, it may sound a little crazy, but, I, you know, just to be honest and transparent, is that I like to uh, challenge myself. And I like to, as I say, put myself in the middle of the action. I like to put myself on the front line of the battlefield, meaning... Uh, when we say, let's say, for example, in a class, ask whatever question you like. And many brothers, they don't do this. Many speakers won't do this. They say, are there any questions? Are there any questions on the topic? So ask any question that you like. In other words, this forces me to remain prepared, to remain sharp, to be constantly reviewing, memorizing, studying, reading, comparing, discussing, and teaching because I'm always engaged. But if you take a, a back seat, oh, uh, I'll prepare for it, or I can't do the khutbah, unless I'm prepared, I can't. Then you become weak and you become dull. So I like to be challenged. I like to be pushed. I like to have uh, things thrown at me that keeps me what? On point. So these are some personal things that I like to do when it comes to what? High aspirations. Last but not least, I would say, um, you mentioned about worldly things. Uh, there are some things certain things that I may read from time to time uh, of, 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 of worldly issues or, or uh, people that were, had a great influence uh, in the dunya that has nothing to do with Islam, and then I apply it to Islam. I Islamify it. And an example of this, a brief example, this is martial arts, okay? The study of martial arts uh, and the different types of martial arts and great martial artists and the whole creed of martial arts, what it stands for, the training, the practice, the, 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 the mental psyche, okay, and how you Islamify that to hadith, as we said, the sharpness of your mind, the sharpness of your words, and that you have to keep practicing your swordsmanship, keep fencing, keep sparring. So these are some personal things, me personally, that I like to do to keep me, as I say, motivated. And maybe, you know, a bit for somebody to accept, or how is this? I'm only being honest and transparent. And if I didn't, I wouldn't be honest with you if I didn't say that. So to summarize, you said three things. The first is reading the biographies of the great Muslims, especially the scholars of hadith, so that you can take Without those models and read the Dao and criticize yourself. Without um, a doubt. Secondly, you mentioned jumping in the deep end, as they say, putting yourself on the front line so that you're forced to step up the levels. So oh, without a doubt. You're pressure. always prepared. You're hmm. always prepared. You always have high experience because I have to do better. And uh -huh. finally, you mentioned 
taking that wisdom from sometimes sources that are not necessarily Islamic, like martial arts, but they have Islamic values or values that can be Islamized. So that you Without a doubt. Uh, if you just look at what some of the non-Muslims did uh, for Islam, some of the books that the Orientalists wrote, you're like, wow, how much money was spent, how much time, painstaking efforts were made to put this service, and what am I doing, sleeping, eating, laughing and chatting on Facebook? And this person is a Muslim. He doesn't know Allah. He doesn't, you see what I'm saying? There's no doubt about that. And Allah is the one who gave the men these different sciences. He taught man that which he didn't know of technology, of philosophy, of psychology, of martial arts, of this and of that. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time. I had many, many questions prepared, as you know, and I'm really enjoying your company. But before um, letting you go, I know you're very busy. Um, we've heard about Hadith disciples. Some of us may have seen the videos on YouTube. And being, inshallah, yani, a person of Himma or a person who's striving to be a person of Himma, what are your goals with Hadith disciples? What are you trying to achieve? Could you share that with us? Sorry, I would say, uh, to sum things up in one word, what we want to do is we want to make a Hadith renaissance. A Hadith renaissance. We want to do as much as we can with our limited knowledge, our limited efforts, our limited time. To serve the Sunnah, to educate the people about the Sunnah, to push it and to make it applicable to their daily lives, and we want to revolutionize it. Many of the misunderstandings, like we talk about the Hadith that the people have that are widespread, we want to demolish them, break them down, and start from the beginning, building the people, teaching the people, nurturing them, instructing them to understand, to memorize, to love, to practice the Sunnah, but properly. So this is considered to be from the creed of the Hadith disciple, is to serve the Sunnah, to be uh, honored by serving the Sunnah, and that when the Sunnah, uh, yeah, I mean, we're not doing the Sunnah a favor; it's a favor for us. So this is the whole concept of a Hadith disciple: is to give the people knowledge that is, as we say, raw and uncut, pure, right from the source, organic, no colors, no preservatives, no artificial things in it but in a simple, brief manner for those that are on an everyday level and those who are all more studious. Those who do understand more, we give them more. This is the concept of Hadith disciples like hot and cold in one cup. Is that it's simple and basic, but complex in detail. And we speak on many, many subjects and topics, creed and theology, uh, tafsir, fiqh, all different things, but the main theme is Hadith. And it is to... Uh, basically live out a dream that I had, okay, and, 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 and what I wanted to be and when I fell in love and uh, the passion of Hadith fell into my heart at a very young age. There was a, a student one day of Imam al dar He was a student of him named Abu Bakr al-Burqani, and he also lived in Baghdad in the, in the fourth century. And uh, one day he, he called out to his students and his friends in the middle of the majlis, and he said, uh, he says, Udu Allah Hadith, and Yanzi Hubbal Hadith O Shahwat al Hadith Min Kalbi Fenu Kat al Hani An Kulishay. He says, I ask Allah, I ask you, huh? I beseech you to ask Allah to remove the passion and the love of Hadith from my heart, for indeed it has preoccupied me from everything else. I can't study anything else, I can't read anything else, it just it has me stuck. So the whole concept of a hadith disciple is like the word in English. High as for a disciple, not a student, not a learner, but a disciple. Someone who's loyal, someone who's capable, someone who's willing, someone who's worthy, someone who is a devotee to this discipline. That's the summary of hadith disciple, what it means to govern your life and also to call others to the sunnah of the Nabi al -Kirim. Not this one, not this scholar, not this person, not these people, not the understanding of the no. Sunnah to Nabi, first and foremost. That is the creed of Hadith disciple. In brief. Jazakallah khairan for sharing with us your dream and your ambition. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it a reality. And Jazakallah khairan for sharing your time with us, most importantly, today. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it a benefit and unite us again soon. I mean, thank you very much for the invitation. It was my honor. Barakallah fiqh, ya That's why maybe I took too much time to answer some of the questions, but as you can see, it's... We're just speaking from the heart. It's how yeah, we and, feel. And we wish we had more time with you, Allah, inshallah. Hopefully in the future we get more time with you. 
Uh, that's it, brothers and sisters. Jazakumullah uh, khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.